Welcome back to my Player Piano Restoration Project. In my previous two videos in this series, I completed the Player Upper Stack Assembly and the Lower Pump Assembly in Governor Restorations. You can find both those videos here or in the description below. Today, I'm going to focus on the piano action, which frankly, if this doesn't operate properly, then it doesn't matter how well I restored the player. The player is only as good as the piano. So the first step was removing the keys and discovering years and years of dirt and things I wasn't even sure what they were. I've always heard of people finding treasures in old pianos and this one did not disappoint. I found this glass marble hidden in here and after cleaning it up and doing some research, I discovered it was very rare and worth $2,000. Just kidding, it was just an old green glass marble. Still cool. After getting it vacuumed out, I could see that the back rail, balance rail, and front rail felt were all worn, and so I would need to replace those. This piece here is part of the key lock feature that is connected to a lever underneath the piano that locks the keys when the pedal door is slid open. I guess it was intended to prevent wear and tear on the piano keys when the player was operating. But what fun is it to watch a player when the keys don't move? I'll remove this part. I cleaned and lubed each pin that the felt goes over, and then here's the key bed with the new felts. I added the new back rail felt later, I didn't get a picture of it. I also cleaned and lubed the holes for the rail pins on each key, and cleaned and polished each cap stand as well. To understand what I would need to get this piano and its action back to decent playing shape, I brought in a local piano technician, Austin, from the Gist Pianos, to give me an assessment. He was very helpful in telling me what I needed to do. So let's go through the list. First is the soundboard, which is the large, thin wooden plate here, which acts as an amplifier of the sound produced by the vibrating strings. Its purpose is to radiate a large volume of sound over a wide frequency range. If there are any cracks or separation of the back ribs to the soundboard, it usually results in buzzing or rattling noises when keys are played. Fortunately, I didn't have any noises, but there were a couple of small cracks in the front of the soundboard, and these were filled with CA glue. CA, or cyanoacrylate glue, is just the industrial name for super glue. Now, there was some small separation in the lower left and right corners of the soundboard, and those were filled with liquid wood epoxy. Now, another trick Austin showed me here was to dope the ribs on the back, basically mean line the ribs with the liquid epoxy to ensure good adhesion between the ribs and the soundboard. Next was to check for cracks along the bridge pins. Now the bridge plays a crucial role in the sound of the piano. It is the job of the bridge to connect the source of the sound, the strings, to the amplifier of the sound, the soundboard. There is a bass bridge. <laughs> oh, oh wow, it must be uh, fishing season. Anyway, there is a bass bridge and then this one is the tenor treble section. The metal bridge pins are driven into the top of the bridge and they serve to evenly space and align the strings as they pass over the bridge. Now a loose pin due to a crack or split can cause a buzz or even loss of tone. Now it's not unusual for old pianos to develop some cracks along the bridge pins, which mine had, and these were also filled with CA glue. And then it was time to remove the piano action out of the piano and then Austin was able to assess the rest of the parts here. So first were the hammers. Many of the hammers wobbled left to right, which meant their hammer butt plates were worn or broken at the brass rail. Now back in the early 1900s, many upright pianos used brass rail flanges as shown here, and the hammer butt flange is held in place between this and the hammer butt plate. Now brass tends to get brittle when under constant stress, and as you can see here, the brass butt uh, hinge broke the hole, making the flange loose. I decided to replace all of them, even though some were still intact. They required this special tool to hold the butt plate in place while the screw was inserted and the hammer reinstalled. By the way, same as the player action, all parts are numbered as every hammer and damper is made to fit a specific location. The other issue with the hammers was that their striking surface was flattening out and they were developing deep string grooves. And when this happens, it can create a harsh and unpleasant tone. Austin said I still had enough hammer felt to be able to file them down and show me how. So I bought this file for this application and filed them until the grooves were mostly gone. 
important part here is, is ensuring the hammers maintain their shape, or you could create more problems. Now this was my first pass, and I was feeling pretty good about it. But after I texted Austin with the results, he said, not enough. So I think my second pass met his expectations. In addition, if you recall, the hammer rail felt was also heavily grooved and worn, and you can see I replaced it with this brand new green hammer rail felt. The next area were the dampers. Now the dampers control the damping or stopping of the string's vibration. Dampers are found on most, but not all strings on the piano. The extreme treble strings do not generate as much sound as the longer strings and do not use dampers. Now when the key, sustain pedal, or pneumatic is engaged, the dampers are raised from the string allowing them to vibrate or resonate until the key or sustain pedal is released. Now all the dampers shown here were dirty and grooved, so they need a new felt as well. So I removed all the dampers, making sure I numbered all of them, and removed the old felt. I installed the tenor treble dampers with the action out of the piano. I was surprised that each of these dampers were incrementally larger than the next. Now with the bass dampers, I installed them with the, when the action was in the piano because they need to specifically align between the two string and one string bass notes. And then plus the wires help hold them in the proper position. One of the most common repairs on an old piano are the bridle straps. Now the bridle straps aid in the repetition of the piano action by helping the hammers return to rest after being played. Now they attach to the hammer butt at one end and a wire attached to the whipping at the other end. They also help keep the whippings in place when the piano action is removed or reinstalled to prevent parts from breaking. As you can see here, all the bridle straps were dry rotted and broken except for a few that appear to have been replaced at one time. Now the new bridle straps have a cork on one end that is easy to install to a hole in the catcher and the other end slips over the bridle wire. Now this is the final step I did in refurbishing the piano action. All the other leather parts were good enough for the piano action to operate. Maybe in another 10 years of playing and some additional attention to the action will be necessary. By the way, I purchased all my piano action parts and felts from Howard Piano Industries out of Tampa. Great folks to work with. So here's the completed action installed in the piano. So stay tuned for the next video in this series. In part 4 I will show you how I regulated the piano and tuned it. What's regulation? Well, to regulate a piano is to adjust all the parts so that they operate uniformly and efficiently. It actually takes a lot of effort. So see you soon.